Good morning and welcome to another edition of Mornings with Matthew. I'm your host, Matthew Tregesser. And today we'll be doing our last episode of Mornings with Matthew. For our listeners out there, we've actually decided that this series will be a mini series and we'll be pursuing a similar project in the upcoming months. But I wanted to let our listeners know out there that this will be actually our last episode. So uh, I'd like to extend a thank you to all the listeners out there and hope you enjoyed uh, the episodes that we've produced for you on a weekly basis. Uh, so today, we'll, we'll, for our final episode here, we'll be talking about two Trump administration initiatives that have received a lot of scrutiny from the media and open borders advocates and, you know, basically what happens anytime the administration releases anything immigration related. So joining me to discuss uh, these two new initiatives is Ferris Preston Hennekins from our government relations department. Preston, welcome to the last edition of Mornings with Matthew. Yeah, happy to be here. The first topic today we'll be discussing are public charge laws and the concept of public charges that the Trump administration recently introduced. So let's begin by telling our audience out there, what are public charges and what are public charge laws? And maybe a couple sentences, Preston. Right. So within the context of immigration, public charge just means that an immigrant who is likely to need certain social services, whether it be Medicaid, Medicare, food stamps, housing assistance, things of that nature, under public charge rules, we we would uh, attempt to not give them immigration status. Uh, and that's something that uh, that that has existed since the 1600s uh, with some of the first colonies in the United States, in the in the country, and now it, it's something that a lot of advocates have wanted for for a while, and now the Trump administration has has pushed through with it. Right. So th- going off of that, you know, I, I've seen in a lot of media and, and reporters making it sound as if these laws are brand new and that they're unprecedented. And as you mentioned, these actually aren't really new at all. I mean, they've existed during the time of the 13 colonies and were a central public policy feature during that time. And think about it. This is when Massachusetts was still a colony. And these laws prohibited importing colonists who basically could not take care of themselves. And so even back then that existed, you know, in the, in the late, you know, 1600s, but then it became a, a comprehensive federal immigration law in 1882, which the Immigration Act of 1882 barred the omission of, quote, any person unable to take care of him or herself without becoming a public charge. So again, you know, I, I see a lot of reporting out there that is making it seem like it's a, a totally new practice. Right. And these didn't come from anywhere. Uh, already, immigrants cannot, and particularly people who haven't become citizens, cannot access Medicare and Medicaid, but their U.S. born children can, obviously. Mm -hmm. So this isn't something that just, you know, came out of thin air from the Trump administration. You know, this is a a general policy that most administrations have followed for decades. And this is just making sure that we're going one step further to make sure that people aren't coming to the U.S. who who have no hope of supporting themselves and are just going to be a drain on social services. Right. You, you know, you bring up a good point by saying that these laws are not really um, something that are, are partisan because, you know, if previous administrations have adopted these, you know, why, again, is the media painting it, painting it as if the Trump administration is this cruel administration that is, you know, anti-immigrant, when in fact, you know, previous administrations on both sides adopted these forms of laws. So in 1996, for example, Bill Clinton, uh, I believe he signed two bipartisan bills to stop aliens from exploiting, you know, public services and benefit programs. You know, and I think a lot of the uh, criticism against the Trump administration is because a lot of people are pushing back against this idea that we want high-skilled immigrants. And I think that's really where the Trump administration is coming from with this proposed rule is that they want to, you know, in every way that they possibly can, ensure that the immigrants who are coming to the U.S. not only can support themselves, but are going to be successful, are going to, you know, start businesses, hire mm-hmm. people, that sort of thing. So I don't think it's meant to be vindictive against, you know, low-income immigrants or potential mm-hmm. low-income immigrants. What I think it's trying to do is trying to encourage 
you know, high skilled, you know, English speaking people who are going to immediately contribute to, right. you know, to business and industry in this country. I, I just don't see how this could even be framed as anti-immigrant. I mean, not, those points are 100 percent on point. But then think about the people that are exempted from these laws. I mean, I, I'll read the list here quickly, but, um, you know, refugees, asylees, TPS recipients, uh, current U.S. citizens who have immigrated to the U.S. Uh, from another country. I mean, there are so many people that this doesn't even apply to, but yet it, it's you, you see all these mainstream media outlets painting it in this different image. Right, and, it, and it, the, the categories that it does apply to are the ones that it really should be targeting in the first place. You know, we shouldn't have people coming over here on an employment visa who might end up taking social services. That's, that's completely mm -hmm. antithetical to what that visa is for. And then second, if we have someone coming over here on a family preference visa or, you know, um, you know, immediate family member visa, wh why would they be falling into the into, you know, poverty to begin with if they're reuniting with family members? That's mm -hmm. it seems just very odd that there's so much pushback against this because you're right. The people who are vulnerable and who are going to probably need these services, they're exempt from this rule. Right. They're going to get them. So what kind of, uh, I guess, government public services are the administration is the administration looking at in terms of you know is it um food stamps is it kind of medicaid like wh what what kind of programs are these yeah a lot of what they've been looking at are, are housing assistance um food assistance and uh -huh. then medicare and medicaid but medicare and medicaid like i mentioned earlier are a little bit different because mm -hmm. potential immigrants uh or i guess immigrants in general until they become citizens can't access those mm -hmm. uh, but if they have citizen family members in the house that uh you know often they do you know it's kind of like a trickle down effect uh, and so i think that's kind of what the administration has been looking at is looking at direct access to housing and, and food benefits and also taking into account if they have U.S. born children that are that are using these programs widely, because that's obviously an indicator that the family household is, you know, is a very low income family. Right. And believe it or not, um, if a non-citizen has a child on soil here, the parents of that child can receive benefits. So exactly. That's, that's that trickle down know, effect. Right. Yeah. And so it, it, it's a. I wouldn't say a loophole, but it, you know, essentially, it kind of is where it's something that is exploited and not really talked about enough. Right. And, and that's just another, you know, uh, you know kind of issue that uh, but a lot of people on the restrictionist side have with the current interpretation of, um, you know, birthright citizenship mm -hmm. in this country is that the, those benefits immediately become available to someone when they have a child in the U.S. So in terms of non-citizens, which consist of, you know, foreign uh, students, guest workers, green card holders, um, would you say that they're really exploiting our nation's welfare system? Because, you know, I, I know open borders advocates will say, look, you know, th that's not happening. That's a complete fabrication. But what I have here, according to the Center for Immigration Studies in a study they did, they found out that two thirds, nearly two thirds, 63 percent of all immigrant led households currently use at least one welfare program in comparison to only 35 percent of native households. So it's interesting. I mean, that's a clear, distinct uh, fact. And again, there's this narrative that it's the reverse, that, you know, no, you know non-citizens are not actually abusing the country's welfare system, when in fact, nope, we just have a study here that shows the complete opposite. Right. And that study um, done by Stephen Camerata is very important because it, it, it uses the, um, it, it includes the the children who were born in the U.S. of illegal aliens, okay. which a lot of those other studies, you know, kind of neglect because mm -hmm. they say, oh, well, you know, these are citizens, which they are. N you know, no yeah. one's denying that. But they're living in a household that's hidden by an illegal alien. Mm -hmm. And so th what Camerata's study does is show that when you include the benefits being given to the U.S. born children who are citizens, it's also benefiting their illegal alien parents. And that that has to be included in any discussion of whether or not aliens are using welfare in this country, because it's and it's a large amount of them, like you said. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, with, with these public charge laws now about to be going into effect, what does this mean for Americans? You know, what, are there advantages of this? Are there disadvantages? I mean, what, what is the main takeaway? 
I think the biggest takeaway, which is what the Trump administration is trying to do, is that it's moving our legal immigration system to one that encourages people to come here that have skills and that can immediately contribute to the American economy instead of take from it. And that's that's very important, and that's something that the Trump administration has tried to do, and it, it's an idea that's tried, you know, they have tried to advance uh, in the past, getting our immigration system to one that is merit-based, that encourages high school immigrants, as opposed to one that w- what we have right now, where it just prioritizes um, family connections. Right. I think about all of the crumbling infrastructure, unaffordable health care, you know, rising college tuition. I mean, there's a lot of things that we could be using, you know, all this money going towards, you know, welfare for non-citizens. And it could be allocated to these items. I mean, it, it's, we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars potentially saved And, you know, the president is simply enforcing longstanding law, which unfortunately, you know, a lot of presidents, even though that their their role is to enforce the laws of the nation, aren't really doing anymore. I think President Trump has been good at this, or at least trying to enforce things that have been, you know, written for a long time and they're just not being enforced anymore. Yeah, exactly. So changing gears a bit, uh, let's move on to the Flores Settlement Agreement, because like the public charge laws, this has also received a lot of scrutiny, um, and it's arguably the biggest loophole in our asyl- asylum process today. So, like with public charge, in a couple of sentences, Preston, how would you describe what the Flores Settlement is? Right. So, the Flores Settlement is essentially an agreement that the government, uh, under Bill Clinton, I believe, settled um, with with um, this claimant, uh, Flores, which meant that the U.S. government has to maintain certain standards of detention for minors um, in its care, and part of part of that agreement included not holding uh, minors in detention for longer than 20 days, mm-hmm. uh, separate from their family, and that that is at the core of the issue right now in how Flores is being interpreted with asylum seekers is that, you know, these, you know, we've had hundreds of thousands of people come to the border and because of the Flores settlement, we cannot separate families or hold children in detention for longer than 20 days. So for instance, um, if Flores was not being applied, we would be able to hold families together in detention while they go through their court proceedings. Um, Whereas now we can't do that and we have to uh, pretty much immediately release families when they when they come to the border. Right. No, that's spot on. I mean, this agreement has led to a, just a humongous surge of family units arriving at the southern border. And I was just looking at uh, data of this, of family unit apprehensions at the, at the southern border. And from between uh, fiscal year 2013 and fiscal year 2018, there was a 2,800% surge and increase of family unit apprehension. So people clearly... There's something going on here because in you know a five-year period, you just don't see uh, an increase that high, and it goes to show you that you know people are starting to find out. Hey, if if I have a child with me, I'm going to be released in less than 20 days, disappear into the interior interior of the country, and you know not show up for my immigration hearing. You know maybe two or three years down the road because you know the backlogs are so backed up, and that's just how it works out. So it's a massive loophole. It essentially almost gains you immediate entry into the country. And the fact that the administration is finally addressing this, I mean, this was, you can ask anyone covering this issue, this is one of the biggest items that needed to be addressed um, to close the asylum loopholes in our system. Right. And he's he's really doing it. Uh, he has to go his own here because Congress has just sat on its hands when it comes to this issue. And under the Trump administration's current thinking, this was an agreement negotiated by the executive branch in the 90s under their thinking you know this might not hold up in court it's mm-hmm. it's going to be challenged there's no doubt about it but under their thinking as the current occupant of the executive branch the Trump administration is saying they don't necessarily have to abide by the agreement if they don't want to because they can pull out of it as one of the you know in the thinking one of the parties that agreed to it even though it was under Bill Clinton's presidency mm-hmm. so um, this will be a, a fascinating, um, you know, case to watch and to mm-hmm. see how 
how it's interpreted in the courts and to see if it makes it to the Supreme Court. Right. I mean, it's, it's definitely a, a game changer. So now with this limit potentially uh, gone, and now we can hold family units together for a longer period of time, you know, what are the advantages of this? I mean, I, I know I, t- I talked about this briefly, but, you know, are, are we going to see less apprehensions, do you think, at the, at the southern border? You know, how is this going to affect the migrant lives and also, you know, just American lives? Right. Um, I personally don't know. And this is this is one of the um, sticking points that uh, Senator Lindsey Graham uh, brought up in his Secure and Protect Act, mm-hmm. which right before the recess, um, his Judiciary Committee marked up. But I'm unsure how this will work because, you know, we say, oh, you know, let's assume there's no court challenge. Oh, we can hold all of these people now as family units together. Right. We can put them in in family shelters. Uh, the truth is, there's not all that much space in family detention right. shelters. There's only, I think, about like two thousand, you know, physical spots that they can use. So I think at the end of the day, it's it's good to to have that loophole kind of tightened up, but unless you're going to start building, you know, new facilities that can house thousands of individuals as family units, there's, there is no way that you're going to be able to hold them. But don't, but don't you think in terms of, you know, the migrant lives, won't this actually save and protect more of them? Because now this loophole has been closed unless people are coming from the Northern Triangle countries, you know, on a 2000 mile dangerous trek to the Southern border through Mexico, you know, combating human smugglers, traffickers, cartels. And so don't you think though that this, by closing this, that it's actually going to save and protect migrant lives Right, more. no, absolutely, and especially the lives of children. And that's yeah. one of the, the points that the Trump administration was highlighting when they rolled this out, was that this will prevent children from being used as, you know, a free meal ticket, yeah. essentially. And that's, Pawns, political that's been, yeah, yeah, that's been one of the big issues, is that when smugglers realized all you needed was a child to get into the United States using the asylum process, people were literally grabbing children just off the street. I mean, they... Yeah. In that, in uh, uh, McAleenan's press conference, he discussed how they've started two pilot programs for DNA testing. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, they were finding that, you know, 10% of the children that were coming across in one of those pilot areas were not related in any way to the people bringing them over, which is just, I mean, that I, should, that, that should yeah. shock people coming I mean, in. And, that, and it's not just in that one area either. That's more than likely representative of the entire border. Right. Now, in addition to migrant lives, don't you think that this is also saving and protecting American lives? Because if you think about it, this whole concept of catch and release, where asylum seekers are basically, especially family units, are released within the you know twenty days and then they disappear into the interior of the country. But you know some of these have some of these migrants have previous criminal convictions, almost unverifiable backgrounds. I mean, if someone shows up with absolutely no documents. I mean, it's hard to verify where they came from, who they are, what their past is. And so, you know, that's what's been happening with, you know, a lot of the lives that we've lost to illegal aliens, you know, throughout the years have been through catch and release policies through this loophole. And so I also think that in addition to saving and protecting migrant lives, that it's also going to save and protect American lives. No, that's absolutely right. And, you know, sadly, you know, you hear these stories from, from groups, like uh, Aliak and and the Angel Moms, who you know, a lot of times their, for instance, their child or their husband or brother died from something as as you know common as drunk driving. So think about it: if we are able to keep one alien who would go on to be a drunk driver and kill someone, I mean, that's that's a life saved. Yeah. So, and, and again, this comes down with anything in immigration enforcement. Any time you're able to to enforce our laws and make, you know, make our communities safer, that, that's a win for the American public easily. So would you say that this agreement is, is partisan or not? I mean, if you think about it, in 2015, when, when the court ruled that, you know, that the, the agreement applied to not only UACs, but also just children with families in general, that was under Obama. That was under Jay Johnson, who presided over this. And then if you think about the original Flores Agreement, that was under Bill Clinton's administration in 1997. So is this really a, a, a partisan type of agreement, do you think? Or is it just kind of, you know, something that uh, officials created to, you know, help both migrants, but also to help, you know, U.S. citizens? 
You know, I, I can't really speak to whether it's partisan or not. I don't think that, for instance, I don't think that Bill Clinton, the, the administration of Bill Clinton negotiated the settlement thinking, oh, this is a, you know, this is to strike against the Republicans. And, you know, I, I also don't think that the judge, even though it's a very partisan judge, I will say, I don't think the judge in 2015 necessarily did it as a political partisan maneuver. Mm-hmm. I think now Democrats defending the Flores settlement, who otherwise would never have known what it was or cared about it if you had asked them prior to 2016, I think now it's become a partisan issue because, of course, now Democrats during you know the primary season for the presidency leading up to the 2020 election, they all have to be on board with, you know, anything that's anti-Trump. And, mm-hmm. of course, if Trump is trying to scuttle this agreement, they're going to support it just reflexively. So what are the chances of this actually being implemented and executed? I mean, as with any Trump administ- administration, immigration initiative, you know, you'll have activists, judicial courts stymieing these regulations and initiatives. And, you know, if you look at the the travel ban or the migrant protection protocols, same thing. They were met with resistance. So do you think, what are the chances of this actually being executed? I don't think that we'll see any f- concrete results from this anytime soon. I think that it will make its way through the courts and we'll just have to see uh, at that point what happens. Uh, if it makes it to the Supreme Court, that may even be an interesting you know, five four decision. We'll see. Yeah, I guess we'll have to see. Unfortunately, we are out of time today, but I'd like to thank Preston for coming on, not only for this episode, but for the rest of the episodes that were uh, involved with Mornings with Matthew. And Preston, we uh, appreciate you always coming on here and giving us uh, your expertise. Yeah, it's been it's been a lot of fun. I look forward to the uh, next podcast series. Yeah. So as I mentioned uh, at the beginning of this episode, we'll be releasing a brand new podcast mini series. Uh, very shortly. So please stay tuned for that. Check us out, especially on Twitter. We provide a lot of uh, updates on there at Fair Immigration, and that's at Fair Immigration. And uh, just keep you know checking the feed, and we'll be giving you guys some more updates about when the next podcast is coming out. Thanks again to all the listeners who supported this podcast over the last couple months, and thanks for supporting Fair. Until next time. Bye.